Bonsoir à tous, merci d'être là euh, pour le premier Meetup Chainlink. Alors c'est un Meetup Chainlink, Palo IT va un peu se présenter aussi, et puis on va avoir Skills qui va faire une démonstration produit. Euh, donc je vais rapidement euh, vous, vous expliquer qui on est Palo IT. Donc euh, là vous êtes dans, dans nos locaux. Donc Palo, on a un cabinet de conseil en innovation et on est spécialisé sur les approches centrées autour de l'humain, euh, du développement agile et on fait de la transformation. Donc on bosse avec des grands groupes ou des petites start-up. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on est présent dans 7 pays euh, et euh, on est à peu près 350 dans le monde. Donc notre vision... La vision de Stan, c'est que chez Palo IT, on essaye d'utiliser de, de, la technologie pour, pour faire avancer les choses dans le bon sens. Et alors, on a un cabinet un petit peu spécial. On a quatre grands principes qu'on essaye d'appliquer tout le temps. Donc, on essaye de designer et de développer des choses, des choses qui sortent de l'ordinaire. On livre tout le temps des produits ou des prototypes qui soient testables, escalables. Euh, on essaye de, faire, euh, de créer de la valeur sur du long terme. On n'est pas là pour faire des coûts. Et tout ce qu'on fait doit s'inscrire dans une confiance de long terme. C'est pour ça que la blockchain, entre autres, euh, nous intéresse. Et, euh, et on essaye de créer euh, des relations euh, organiques euh, avec nos, nos partenaires pour, pour la durée. Hop, pardon. Donc, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on fait chez Palo IT euh, Toutes nos offres vont être construites un petit peu de la même chose. On va avoir trois grandes sections. Une première qui, qui, qui est orientée euh, innovation, où euh, on va avoir beaucoup de méthodologies. On va faire du design thinking, mais on va faire aussi de la recherche euh, avec des partenaires. Donc, euh, dans le cadre de la blockchain, on va pouvoir vous présenter ce qu'on fait rapidement. On va construire des solutions, on va développer et puis derrière on va essayer de les automatiser et de permettre en tout cas aux entreprises avec lesquelles on bosse euh, bah, de pouvoir évoluer euh, d'elles-mêmes. Donc là, juste rapidement un focus sur la recherche. Donc on fait des partenariats de recherche avec des, des laboratoires comme le laboratoire d'informatique de Paris 6. Euh, on fait de l'écriture de papier, de la simulation euh, et puis après, vous allez le comprendre, on fait beaucoup de recherche utilisateur et, et tout ça, ça voilà. c'est notre impact lab. Euh, donc on va ensuite construire des, des solutions. Donc là, on a tout un, tout un, tout un panel d'expertise, on va faire de la blockchain, mais on va faire du DevOps, de la data, etc. Et enfin, on va faire du, du scaling. Donc nous, on inclut le coaching là-dedans. On va faire du training euh, euh, technique pour des développeurs, des architectes, etc. chez nos clients. Euh, on fait aussi euh, des, des workshops et des ateliers pour des leaders dans des grands groupes, pour qu'ils arrivent à comprendre un petit peu les problématiques qu'on peut rencontrer avec la blockchain, etc. Et puis, on est des spécialistes des, des workshops et de la co-création. Donc, on fait beaucoup de, de game design, de choses comme ça. Euh, voilà. Donc, <coughs> Palo IT, c'est un ensemble de compétences. On va avoir des data scientists, des designers, euh, des coachs agiles, product owners, des experts techniques. Et alors, notre mission principale, en tout cas sur la blockchain et la recherche, on a deux grands axes. Euh, principal axe, c'est l'interopérabilité. Nous, on pense que, euh, que in fine, il n'y aura pas juste une blockchain pour les dominer toutes, mais qu'il y en aura euh, voilà, quelques-unes, peut-être pas autant qu'il y a aujourd'hui. Euh, par contre, il faudra qu'elles communiquent. Et c'est pour ça que depuis un an et demi, on s'intéresse à tout ce qui est Atomic Swap euh, et l'interopérabilité interopérabilité entre, entre blockchain. Euh, et donc pour ça, on accompagne euh, des, des entreprises produits, donc des blockchains que vous, que vous connaissez. Et puis à côté de ça, notre autre challenge, ça va être euh, d'essayer d'améliorer l'expérience que les utilisateurs peuvent avoir quand on navigue sur des DAP, par exemple, donc tout le monde connaît le MetaMask, euh, euh, potentiellement il faut acheter euh, de l'Ether euh, si on a envie de faire des transactions sur une DAP. Donc euh, toute cette expérience-là qui n'est pas 
facile, je dirais, pour euh, quelqu'un qui ne vient pas de ce monde-là. Nous, on le voit quand on bosse avec des grands groupes. C'est très compliqué. Euh, donc, euh, pour améliorer ça, voilà, nous, on fait de la recherche là-dessus. Donc, euh, on va bosser sur de la métatransaction, des gas relayers, euh, des multisig, de l'authentification. Tout ça dans un concept un peu général. Notre objectif chez Palo, là, aujourd'hui, en recherche, c'est euh, d'essayer d'aller un peu plus vite euh, que ce qu'on pouvait faire avant entre euh, recherche appliquée et, euh, et produit en prod. Voilà, donc on essaye de, de minimiser le timing entre ces, ces deux grandes étapes-là. Et c'est pour ça qu'on prend des partenariats euh, avec des laboratoires. <rire> Alors, euh, donc quand, on fait, euh, quand on bosse avec des labos, euh, on va faire euh, du test, euh, des preuves formelles des démonstrateurs pour être certain que, que ce qu'on propose euh, euh, sera réalisable. On a travaillé dans le secteur bancaire avec notamment BNP, AXA sur de la tokenisation d'assets, donc c'était des fonds. Euh, on fait de la compliance, on a bossé sur des solutions de KYC, d'AML et des exchanges aussi d'assets tokenisés. Euh, on travaille sur des problématiques de traçabilité dans le luxe. Alors on a fait ça sur des bijoux, notamment avec Van Cleef euh, et de la supply chain. Alors là, du coup, on essaye de tracer un petit peu tout. Donc on dit que c'est de la fourche à la fourchette. Euh, on va aller euh, regarder euh, de la production euh, de, de plantes, de, enfin, l'élevage d'animaux. Puis on va aussi regarder bah, tous les traitements qu'on euh, voilà, euh, qu qu va leur appliquer euh, pour, in fine, arriver dans l'assiette. On travaille aussi dans de l'énergie euh, sur notamment les problématiques de recharge de véhicules électriques. Donc là, on s'occupe d'un consortium avec Enedi, CDF. Euh, euh, principe assez simple, c'est comment est-ce qu'on fait euh, quand on a une voiture électrique, qu'on doit aller se recharger au bureau ou à la maison, ou alors dans un immeuble, avec, nos, avec toutes les personnes qui vont vivre dans l'immeuble aussi, il faut facturer la bonne personne, etc. Voilà. Et puis, euh, récemment, on a commencé à s'intéresser aux médias, avec de la certification de photographie, pour de la photo un petit peu spéciale, euh, donc de, de reportage, par exemple, de guerre. Euh, et puis, comment est-ce qu'on fait bah, pour qu'un euh, photographe puisse certifier ses photos, prouver que c'est lui qui les a faites, donc il est censé euh, toucher ses droits d'auteur là-dessus, et puis automatiquement les distribuer, peut-être avec une politique tarifaire que lui déterminera, et, euh, et derrière, euh, bah, collecter euh, les fonds euh, qu'il euh, euh, qui, qui, qui est censé collecter euh, à la suite de, de la réalisation de ses photos. Aujourd'hui, l'équipe de Palo IT sur Paris, on est quatre avec euh, pas mal de gens qui viennent du Lipsis. <coughs> on a deux Nantais et des personnes sur Singapour. Alors on a des activités blockchain aussi euh, du côté de Mexico. Et euh, en fait, le bureau de Paris fait pas mal d'advisory sur, euh, sur les autres pays pour l'instant. Mais ça tend à grossir. Et puis nos partenaires principaux, donc on va avoir le Lipsis avec Maria Potop. Euh, donc c'est euh, elle qui euh, s'assure euh, du fait que... Euh, quand on fait des papiers, euh, voilà, ils soient bien sérieux. Euh, euh, et, puis, euh, et puis, du coup, on va publier avec elle. Euh, et alors, les, 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 les entreprises qui font du produit avec lesquelles on est en partenariat, donc on a Andromaque sur le domaine de la photographie et euh, du journalisme. Et puis, en cours, on a euh, les deux messieurs qui sont assis à côté de moi, donc Skills et Chainlink. Euh, et une des raisons pour lesquelles ils sont là aussi aujourd'hui, c'est qu'on partage tous une vision euh, assez proche de l'interopérabilité. Et euh, du coup, Chainlink va pouvoir nous, nous parler de ça. Et puis, euh, Laszlo aussi sur Skills. Donc, rapidement, je vous avais parlé de Mobility Chain, donc le consortium dans lequel on est euh, dans les voitures électriques. Euh, et puis, on est dans quelques associations aussi et des groupes de dev. Voilà quelques clients euh, qui nous font confiance. Et puis du coup, je vais laisser la parole à, à Laszlo pour ce qu'il sait. Cool. <rire> Top.
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to switch in English. Um, it's not that I, I don't like to speak French, um, <laughs> uh, but we are live on Twitch. Um, all the content is in English, and uh, Johan is going to speak uh, English afterwards, so I don't want to, him to feel alone. Um, so um, thank you very much, uh, Arthur, for hosting us tonight um, for this great event about um, next generation of building um, uh, smart contract, connected smart contract with Chainlink. And um, I'm the CEO of uh, Skills. We're developing a blockchain as a service product. Uh, my name is Laszlo Sabo, like uh, Nick Sabo. <laughs> um, he, he just forgot to uh, um, give me an, an Bitcoin. Otherwise, I won't be there. Um, and yeah, so today I'm going to talk about Skills vision. Um, and how we uh, deploy blockchain um, at your fingertips. So today's talk is going to be divided by our vision, as I told you, which is a decentralized uh, BAS product supporting uh, multi-protocol. Then we'll explain how we will integrate with Chainlink and we'll give you a decentralized uh, finance use case, typical uh, decentralized finance use case with Chainlink. And uh, at the end, I will show you a demo of the product. Cool. So um, our vision, decentralized past products supporting multi-protocol. So what we think and what we try to deliver is that um, we deploy private and public nodes, private and public connection to the blockchain in companies. We do it on premises or on multi-cloud. And uh, we use and we support multi-protocol. With three, uh, we see sorry, uh, three advantages of this. The first one is often the blockchain, um, you know, is just is coming on top of software that are already used by companies. Um, so the blockchain has to adapt uh, on the client infrastructure, uh, cloud client clouds or client uh, on-premise uh, servers. Uh, also, we try to avoid a single point of failure, uh, meaning that <clears throat> um, we push our clients to deploy private consortium um, in a decentralized way. Um, basically, one node will, could be on-premises, one node could be on one cloud and the other one on, on another one. We think that um, if you deploy a private consortium on one cloud, AWS or Azure, for example, it's a bit too centralized. And we don't actually run the um, nodes of our clients. We uh, push um, our clients to be responsible of their nodes. So if our platform uh, is falling down, the blockchain is still uh, running, uh, either the private one or uh, the public node connecting to a, a public blockchain. So, and lastly, multi-protocol, we think that <clears throat> if you tokenize an asset on Ethereum, <clears throat> or if you tokenize an asset on Tezos, it um, doesn't have the same advantages. Um, proof of stake, um, you know, will have um, uh, more uh, transaction per second. Um, the gas price and policy will be better. But then, <clears throat> if you use Tezos today, uh, they don't have like mature smart contracts. Um, the Ethereum ecosystem could be uh, much easier for many clients to deploy um, uh, tokenized assets. So um, let's talk about to like uh, how our platform will integrate with Chainlink um, in the future. So I'm going to talk about a use case um, of off-chain payments, paying a digital assets. Um, using Chainlink and deploy on our platform. So here you have four actors. Um, you have BAS, which is actually our platform. You have um, a bank right here. You have um, Swift, because the bank will pay, you know, traditionally uh, through Swift. Chainlink, that's going to connect the um, old world with the new world, which is um, Equisafe, uh, that is connected on public blockchain, um, either Ethereum and maybe Tesos in the future, and Equisafe is doing uh, its a digital asset solution. So the first thing you will do 
is with the platform, you will um, launch a node and connect to either Ethereum or Tesos. And Equisafe will be able to connect to the blockchain and tokenize an asset. Then the bank will do uh, an off-chain payment through SWIFT. Then this payment information um, will pass from the SWIFT API to the Chainlink Oracle and the Chainlink SWIFT Oracle. And lastly, um, this payment assessment uh, will be connected uh, from the Chainlink Oracle to the Equisafe smart contracts. So you really see how um, you connect um, like old or normal payments uh, information through the Chainlink Oracle to the public blockchain. And lastly, obviously, because um, the smart contract will be told that this payment uh, was initiated with SWIFT, the token will be delivered uh, on chain um, to the bank. So that's it for the use case. And now I'm going to show you the, the a bit of the product. So what I'm going to show you today is how we deploy a um, private consortium on a few clicks through our platform uh, between two actors, two players, two companies. Um, so I pre-created two accounts. Uh, one is Yuan from Chainlink, and the other one uh, is Arthur uh, from Palo IT. So um, I'm going to connect to the platform. The first thing you see, basically, is a simple explanation of what is a BAS, what is blockchain as a service, what is a blockchain node, then what is a consortium? A consortium, it's a private blockchain shared between several companies. And further documentation, if you are a developer, you can access to this doc on the platform. Um, basically, yeah, what, what is a consortium, blah, blah, blah. So the first thing you, you will do is actually create a consortium. So I'm going to call it Yoan and Arthur. Good. I'm going to invite Arthur into the consortium. Now I have an empty consortium between two people, two companies, without any nodes. So I'm going to create a node. I have two options. Either I'm a developer and I can you know, deploy it uh, on-premise. <clears throat> and just I have to copy and paste three common lines on a dockerized uh, instance. Uh, but because I'm not a developer, I'm going to click on, you know, um, automatic deployments. You can see several clouds, and I'm going to choose Amazon. So here you have to understand that um, this is the um, platform, Amazon platform of Yoan. Um, we are able to deploy the nodes. We are able to make them reliable. But our company is not able to uh, shut down the node. Uh, because that's the uh, cloud platform of the client using it, using the platform. So uh, I'm going to deploy. It takes usually a minute and a half. So I already have a node active that I'm going to connect to the consortium. Take a few seconds. And here you see a consortium between two players and one node then is, is connected. I'm going to do exactly the same with Arthur. So you see the consortium, create a node. I hit on deploy. You can choose, choose the instance, obviously. Um, here it's the smallest one, um, T micro on Amazon. And I'm going to connect to the consortium. So what uh, you see here is actually a private blockchain shared between two different companies on their uh, cloud platform. And it took us a um, few minutes. Um, so you can see that there is a blockchain explorer here that is empty uh, because we didn't deploy any smart contract. So um, 
what I'm going to do right now is using MetaMask. I'm, I'm sure you know MetaMask to um, like store your, your private keys on the web browser. Um, and we're going to use Remix to ch like choose a template uh, of smart contracts. Um, in the future, we're really planning to internal, uh, like to develop our own KMS, um, key management uh, system. And we uh, intend as well to put uh, smart content templates on the platform. So you won't have to do uh, uh, this. So I'm going to go on the notes. Um, I'm going to just go on MetaMask, connect um, to the blockchain that that just created so i'm just naming the construct the, the um, i'm just naming the connection and using um http um and i um, will just enter actually this is a, a ux issue that we're working on now i'm going to enter the um, ip of the node just hit on save uh, reset MetaMask because it can be a bit grumpy sometimes. I'm sure you know MetaMask. Um, and then just go on Remix. Deploy a smart contract. So really our vision uh, is you know not to show our clients some line of code. Uh, if you are a developer, you will be able to see what is the template of smart contract on the platform. Um, if you are not, you just be able to uh, see what the smart contract is for, for what use case, and you will be able to deploy it on one click. Um, so yeah, there you go. I just deployed it. Basically, um, you can see that the contract is pending here. With new blockchain, a uh, smart contract can take a um, few minutes to uh, be deployed. Um, so I'm not uh, going to wait you, um, going, going to make you uh, wait a few minutes, just going to show you um, a consortium that I already deployed. And you can see, um, you know, the number of blocks, uh, the last transaction uh, that has been uh, made uh, when the, the blocks has, has been mined, and the contract that has been deployed with the input here. And yeah, that's basically it. And as I told you, and as I show you on my presentation, in the future, the idea is to connect with layer two and layer three solution, such, such as uh, Chainlink and Equisafe. Thank you so much. And thank you. And I'm going to be around um, if you have any questions. And now uh, I'm giving the word to Johan. <coughs> Okay, it's working. So thank you everyone for being here. So I'm Johan, I'm a product manager at uh, Chainlink. So I'm French with a very strong accent as you can probably see. <laughs> and yeah, so today I'm going to talk about Chainlink, what problem we are solving, what we are working on, and I'm going to make a demo of what's currently live and what we can currently do using Chainlink. So first off, um, as you may know, smart contracts are currently not able to access real-world data. That means that if you have a financial contract on Ethereum, right now we cannot access any market data, any FX data, commodity data. If you want to have an insurance contract on Ethereum, it cannot access IoT data, for instance, to get the temperature of a package. Or any other, like any kind of data that you would have in the real world is not accessible currently to smart contracts and that restricts tremendously what you can currently have on the blockchain. So basically what you're trying to do at Chainlink is connect real world data to smart contracts and to blockchain, whether it's on Ethereum, Tezos, or any other blockchain. So that means that any kind of API endpoint that you have in the world should be accessible using Chainlink. That also means that currently, in the point where we are in the industry, people might not feel confident uh, paying in crypto. I mean, even myself, I don't feel super confident paying in crypto, you know, like <laughs> you can be in this industry forever, it's so volatile. Maybe you don't want to make transactions in Bitcoin or Ethereum if the price is going to drop 
you know, if it's going to rise, then it's okay, but uh, it's <laughs> dropping quite a bit. <laughs> so basically what we want to do is to allow people to transact using APIs such as PayPal, such as Swift, such as any other kind of uh, traditional API payment you would be using in the real world. So if you have a smart contract on Ethereum that's supposed to trigger a payment, instead of having this payment in Ether, it could be a PayPal payment, for instance. So here we have the inputs and we have the outputs. What we also want to be able to have is triggering actions from one blockchain to another. So let's say something happens on the Ethereum blockchain, we want to trigger a Bitcoin payment. Or if a certain action happens on Tezos, then we want to trigger something on Ethereum. So basically, inputs, outputs with the real world, and connectivity between chains. That's our goal. So that's a big goal. It's basically connecting the blockchain world to the real world and interconnecting blockchains together, right? So how do we achieve this? Well, currently we believe there is a, an issue with the um, ecosystem where if you want to connect a smart contract to the real world, you don't want to have one single oracle connecting this smart contract. If you've gone through all of this trouble, uh, coding a smart contract, deploying on Ethereum, learning about Ethereum, getting Ether, you don't want your smart contract which is super secure, which is secured by thousands of nodes which are spread across the world. You don't want this smart contract to be triggered by one single oracle, which would be ultimately a point of failure. If you are a CIO or if you are a CTO in a big uh, enterprise, you want to make sure that your system is secure end-to-end. -end. That means the smart contract, but that also means the inputs which are triggering the smart contract and the outputs, the payment method. So that means that currently, um, if you want to have security at the data layer, you have two kind of, um, so you have three layers. You will have the smart contract layer, you will have the Oracle layer, the kind of nodes which are responsible to get data from data providers to the smart contract, and then you have the data provider. So the data provider can be Reuters, Bloomberg, any kind of data provider which usually provides market data or IoT data, etc. So basically, we apply decentralization to make sure that the data that's given, that's fed into smart contracts, is as decentralized as possible. So we are applying the same methods that we use to secure smart contracts, which is decentralization. Instead of having nodes which are mining the state of the blockchain, we have nodes which are mining data at any point. Okay? So then, yeah, we, I'm really not good with these slides. I forget what's coming after and before, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so now, just for a small example about, um, about this. So how would you use Chainlink in a real-world contract? Let's say Alice has a contract with Bob and an SEO work. So she wants Bob to get her website across the top 10 ranking on Google, let's say. If Bob is able to do this, then he gets a $50 payment. If he's not able to do it, then he doesn't get paid. So um, here I have a contract uh, on Remix. Who here is familiar with uh, Remix? Uh, you, you are using it, but let's see. Okay, so quite a few people. So yeah, it's a very easy kind of IDE that you can launch on the browser and uh, allows you to easily deploy smart contracts and to showcase what you can do in a, you know, not too hard of a manner. So let's say I'm going to deploy my smart contract so I can just um, transact. I'm going to deploy it uh, using Robston, which is one of the test nets. Um, so we, send in, we like to use Robston because usually it replicates the state of the main net as accurately as possible, uh, which means that it's very often down also, so it's kind of risky to use in demos, but yeah. Um, so here I'm going to show a bit about the variables that you have. So we have the Oracle payment. So the Oracles which are going to provide data are going to get a payment, right? No one is going to be running a node and paying the infrastructure cost and not getting paid. So basically these nodes are getting paid uh, in link token. So number of oracles. So how many oracles do we want um, to get data from? How many oracles are we going to use in our smart contracts? In this case, we'll have five. Um, the number of oracle really depends on your use case. If you have a smart contract which is securing millions of dollars of value, then maybe you want more oracles. Uh, if you have $50, um, 
you can you can have five it's fine even here i feel like five is way too secure but that's fine <laughs> minimum responses so how many responses are we going to await before saying that this data is valid so i sent a request three people answered well as soon as i get three answers then my data is valid all right then we have the escrow amount so how many how much are we going to get paid here is 50 dollars required rank so here I mentioned we want the website to be in the top 10. So that's what you have here. Uh, ranking URL, so here, yeah, here I'm just going to show. So for the sake of this example, we just put up uh, an easy endpoint to see. So it's basically this, um, you know, this data point which you can read from. And then we have the ranking pass. This I'll go, I'll go into details on, on this after. Um, and then we have an array with oracles, and these oracles, so these are addresses, right? So I'm going to show a bit about um, the, the Chainlink network as it is currently. Here, as you can see, these oracles all have addresses on Ethereum, right? If I go to something called market.link, so um, it's basically a marketplace of oracles which was created by a third party called Linkpool, which has done tremendous work for uh, Chainlink. So, Basically, these are super passionate people who have been running nodes for Chainlink preparing for a while now, and they've been on mainnet for uh, two months, which is as old as Chainlink is currently on mainnet. And these people are building third-party tools for the ecosystem and providing a lot of value there. So uh, basically, this marketplace lists all the nodes which are currently operating on Chainlink. So all the oracles which are currently mining data for smart contract creator. So here we have Link Pool, we have Fuse, we have Chain Layer, we have Link Forest, Vitez, Sortus so One. So what's good about this is really these nodes currently. If I was to go and check, for instance, Sortus so One, Sortus uh, so One, I could check and see who these people are. You know, so I can see that Sortus so One um, is a delegation service which is also running blockchain infrastructure on Tezos and Cosmos. They have a big cybersecurity background. Uh, Zaki Manion is speaking about them. So Zaki Manion is a very smart person. So if he's saying good things about them, then we can say maybe they're smart. <laughs> so yeah, basically you can see it's very transparent. You can um, you can check who these people are. Who can check who is speaking about them? All of this stuff, right? And you can see how many jobs they have, how many runs they have, so how many jobs they fulfill, and how many uh, jobs they currently support. So if I go on to jobs, for instance. I can see what kind of jobs are currently available on the Chainlink network. So ETHUSD from Crypto Compare, ETHUSD. So currently there is a lot of ETHUSD. The network has been live for two months, and the crypto prices are the most in uh, kind of in want right now by DeFi projects. So that's what a lot of node operators are um, are feeding. We actually have a pretty cool, um, let's see, a pretty cool. Uh, I'll probably show after. Um, yeah, we have reference contracts which are basically providing the price of ETHUSD, of BTCUSD from multiple nodes across the network. And these prices are being fed by um, nodes that you can see here on the link pool marketplace. Okay, so here basically I can go to this marketplace, choose who I want to use for my smart contract. Um, the more secure, the more reputations I have, of course, the more I, I would be inclined to use them. So that's what we have here in our contract. We have oracles, which are currently in the uh, link pool marketplace. And that's how you'll be choosing them, these oracles here. And then we have the jobs. So jobs, basically, chaining nodes are always um, monitoring the state of the Ethereum network and searching for jobs to fulfill. So these jobs are basically what kind of data point I need to get, what kind of API endpoint I need to access. Um, so yeah, basically, these are the jobs that uh, chaining nodes will be fulfilling. Uh, then we go on to, yes, so that's an array which will contain um, the ranking, basically like the different rankings, the answers that we get from our oracles. Um, and let's see, I'm, I'm just going also to launch my request this way, um, we don't have to wait too much. Um, so yeah, before, before sending payments to, um, to oracles, you need to make sure that your contract is funded. Uh, with link token, because this link is basically the way of payment, the way to pay node operators on the Chainlink network. So here I'm going to send seven link. Uh, notice that you need only five link. 
Um, yeah, I hope uh, I hope Robston is going all right tonight. Uh, let's see. Fast. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we are just using five nodes. One link for every node, so we need only five link. We are sending seven just for uh, demo purposes. Um, so what our link is uh, sending, if we go to our requests, what we have, we can see um, different functions. So create request, for instance, is just going to send a request for every oracle that we have in our oracles array. So very straightforward. And what is a request? So a request is basically, we can see it here, it's a get ranking function. So this function is going to build a chain link request. The chain link request needs to have the URL which we are accessing, which is the paste bin I showed uh, a bit earlier. So this can be an API endpoint. This can be any kind of API you need to access. Uh, the ranking path, so that's the path that you are going to parse whenever we get our answer from our Oracle node. So here we want the ranking of uh, the website. So we are going to path uh, to parse, sorry, the ranking path variable. And then um, then we send our request, basically. That's, yeah. um, then this function is called fulfill ranking. So fulfill ranking is being called by node operators, by oracles, whenever they fulfilled the job ID. So whenever they got the answer for our uh, smart contract creator to look at, they will call this function, and they will push their answer onto the rankings array. Whenever we get three responses, then we can aggregate the ranking. Aggregate the ranking is basically going to check that all, um, that basically the answers that we got prove that we are top 10 for our website, which in this case we are. And if we are, that we are then we are going to get the price of Ether uh, using a Ether-SD reference contract, which, was, which I was referring above. And we are going to pay $50 worth of Ether to Bob in this case. So let's see how it would all work. Um, I think my link probably got transferred now. Um, all right, so we have seven link and we have the ether. So let's create a request and see what happens. All right, by the way, any questions for what I explained until now or all good with you? Okay, that's good. So either I'm doing a very good job or, or a very bad one. Oh, okay. <laughs> find the, the nodes we are going to use uh, before deploying the contract? Yeah, so these nodes basically, it was what I was showing um, a bit earlier, you can find them on the link pool marketplace. So if I want to use another one, let's say I want to use Certus One, yeah. I could just go there, take the Oracle address, copy paste, and put it here. Uh, let's replace, for instance, Honeycomb or Secure Data Links by Certus One, you know? Okay. So basically, I need to list a lot of nodes there in case there are any nodes that go offline. Or yeah, if, go if one of the nodes go offline, the reputation is going to take a very big hit, and you can be ensured that then you wouldn't really see them in the top rankings on uh, the link pool marketplace, right? So, But suppose uh, one node that I choose uh, is not providing the data that I need anymore. Yeah. What I mean, in this case, so that's a public API, right? So the data that's being provided here, it's public, so that's no issue whatsoever. Every node should be able to use it if they are running the core chain link software. Okay. Um, so yeah, that shouldn't be an issue. And if one of the nodes stop running, then you still have four other ones, yes. and your data will process if you get three transactions, right? Now, what you're referring to is really uh, having deficient nodes, and the way you fight deficient nodes is by having more nodes and by having more reputable nodes, right? Okay. So that's basically the way to, to do it there. Any, yeah? Um, is there a time frame on the, how, how long can the, the smart contracts work? Do you need like, let's say the, the service provider takes three months to get the website to the front page. <coughs> Would you need additional funding in the smart contract? Or? So you are the one triggering the action to send the request to the node operators. So whenever you feel like like let's say uh, Alice had put two months for Bob to get this website on the top ranking, then she's the one triggering the action. So you decide whenever you need to send this request. So in this case, you're fully in control of when you are sending payment, when you need to fund, etc. Make sense? Okay. Uh, 
Uh, are you able to uh, aggregate different uh, data providers? For example, so your example is about uh, Google Data Ranking. So Google yeah, is great question. the only data provider but for, for example, financial market data. Are you able to see different mar uh, different data provider? Of course, uh, yeah. Aggregate them and then uh, decide if. Uh, yeah, if great question. Um, or which data is correct? I'm just going to look for my link, which shows, and I'm going to disconnect my computer for two seconds because I don't like going to my favorites while I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> uh, hmm. Because that's a good question, so I want to make sure I can show you, and I'm also a careful person. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right. Yeah. Basically, currently our no, our aggregator contract on Ethereum is getting data from I think um, eight different data providers. These data providers are, for instance, Coin Market Cap, Coin API, uh, Kaiko, BNC, and many others. So yeah, we can get this data uh, from different data providers and then aggregate it. So I'm just looking for a link now uh, to to show you because we actually made a Pretty cool, I think, um, overview of this on our, uh, let's see, da, 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 links. OK, cool. Right. Yeah, you can never be too safe whenever you're sharing your computer. <laughs> uh, all right, yeah. So that's our reference contract for ETHUSD price. And as you can see, we have different data node operators. So we have LinkForest, we have ChainLayer, we have LinkPool. You can see which price they are giving out right now. And you can see all of these prices are slightly different, right? Because all of these uh, oracles are using different data providers. So one of them will be using CoinMarketCap, another CoinAPI, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So that's really a great question because, as I was saying, like. Um, in data, you have when, whenever you want to get data to smart contracts, you have two layers. One is data provider layer. You don't want to rely only on coin market cap if you are going to get a price. And then you have the Oracle layer. So our ETHUSD reference contract currently is decentralized both at the Oracle layer. We have 15 node operators relaying this data. And at the data provider layer. Does it answer your question? Or? Yes. All right. So. And you can also do like some cool stuff with this. It's really nice. I find it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I guess our request is probably done. Um, now we have an explorer where you can check the. Let's see. Uh, is that the? That's not the right one. Okay. Uh, so that's our contract on Ethereum, and if we go to the Chainlink Explorer, we can see that we sent a request to five node operators five minutes ago. Um, so if I go there, for instance, I can see that the request got completed by these node operators, which means they answered our request, right? So if I go to Etherscan, that means that my payment probably got triggered. It means that the smart contract basically got executed because we got uh, five answers. And so if I check here, if I update my page, I can see, yeah. So we made a payment, the, the smart contract self-destructed, and basically um, Bob got paid, like his link token. So if we look, yeah, you see like the internal transaction shows that the payment happened. And so that's the $50, and the 0 0.038 is what remains of the $50. Um, and since the smart contract self-destructed, it got sent back to the owner of the smart contract. Okay, so yeah, basically that was a really small showcase of how to do a small SEO contract using Chainlink. Please. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. What if uh, we need uh, external information on info on information that is not market prices? Yeah. Something as mundane as uh, the Velib station that is just around the corner. As long as there is an endpoint that you can connect to, we can have something called an external adapter. Basically, an external adapter is something that we create. It can be in Java. It can be in um, it can be in any language in Golang, in Rust, and it allows you to plug into any kind of API endpoint that you have in the world, basically. So we've done this for 
the PayPal API, we've done this for flight stats, which gives the flights data, we've done this for easy post. So we have multiple, multiple external adapters as examples that you can use. And if you need to connect to a valid station, then, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> <It's easy. coughs> Thank you. Yeah. How long does it take? to connect to a new uh, data provider uh, like a VELP station? It depends who's doing it in the sense that, for instance, if it's us doing it, like we are very used to doing external adapter and in the end it's mostly the same stuff. You know, you, you basically make sure that you, uh, the data you're getting is standardized in a certain way that the channel node can understand. Um, it depends if there is WebSocket API. So basically uh, multiple things. Um, it can be very fast. It can be as fast as 30 minutes and, or a bit longer. It's not long. Like we've, when, when you're creating a system that needs to connect to any kind of, any, uh, any kind of API endpoint in the world, then you have to make it modular. You don't, you don't have a choice. You know? So basically, it's very streamlined and quite easy to do if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Do you need a lot of gas to run the smart contracts? Um, it depends how many requests you are going to send to node operators. So if you have 10 node operators and you need to send 10 requests, it can get very pricey. That's why we are looking at other ways to do aggregation of chain, for instance. And yeah, like the gas prices are currently an issue on Ethereum. Everyone knows this. Uh, the, the network is still clogged from a tether or something <laughs> right now. So yeah, depending on how many requests you need to send, it might cost gas. Yeah. So for this request, how much uh, did it cost actually? In gas? Uh, it's set at 20 guay. No, how much gas, gas? Uh, uh, yeah, like, how do we check this again? I forgot completely. Uh, it's been too long. On, uh, on the uh, transaction. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Transactions. Okay. Uh, you go there. Oh, yeah, transaction has. You can see the transaction fee. Yeah, so that's how much. Uh, yeah, it will really depend on the state of the network. It always changes. Like it's a transaction, like any other transaction you could have on Ethereum. Uh, basically, the only thing with Chainlink is that the more nodes you need to have, the more transactions you are going to send, right? So you, the more gas you are going to pay. So now I would like to showcase also how you can create um, the contract that I just showcased, how you can create it using Truffle. Um, who here is familiar with Truffle or has already done some work with Truffle? All right. Yeah, a few people. So yeah, if you are going to do anything serious with smart contracts, you probably need Truffle. Um, it's a really good streamlined environment you can use to create smart contracts in an easy way. So um, for Chainlink, we have a Truffle box, which allows you to easily set up a dev environment uh, to use our oracles. So see contract. So I'm just going to to go through the process of what it would be to use a, to set up a truffle contract, run through some tests, and you get you guys can see the process basically to set up a chaining contract. So um, if I do eggs, none of this is open source, right? Yeah, yeah. Even if I have a node, chaining node. Everything is open source. Uh, all our code is open source. Actually, if you want to track the, um, if you ever want to track the progress and what you're doing, um, as far as um, development, I'll show you after our developer tracker. It's somewhere out there. Uh, yeah, we have a developer a pivotal tracker, which is completely open source, and where you can see what we are working on and what kind of initiatives you are doing at any point. So all our development is open source for the community to see, both on GitHub and on Pivotal Tracker. So here, Turf and Box, Mark Contract. OK, so basically, I'm going to unbox my uh, Truffle project. It can take some time. So meanwhile, if you guys have any questions. Yeah. <laughs> is it possible to? Um, right now, we need to run a transaction in order to uh, to get uh, to request the data that we need. Is it possible to make the nodes send the data to a specific smart contract at a certain rhythm? So you mean the smart contract wouldn't trigger it? Yeah. You can have a cron job, which is going to basically every five minutes. I'm going yeah. to have this. this is, Those this are. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a very good point. Those are points that we'll probably work on in the future. Currently, I think most of the ecosystem is happy with triggering the contract, okay. you know, by themselves. It also can give more, like, it, it's something that you can work on right now as a developer. Yeah. It's not too constraining from what you've seen right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of questions. Uh, who? Yeah, go ahead. I had a question. So, um, actually, in the fulfill uh, mm. for a while, when the Oracle uh, will uh, call, back, call again uh, our smart, con uh, smart contract, actually, the, the result, the answer, the response, yeah. is just uh, typically, typically for crypto compare, for example, to get the price of a token, you can just receive uh, one uh, int. Uh, actually, the crypto compare uh, API provide a way to receive uh, from the JavaScript uh, part uh, a JSON, so we can ask for the price of Ether, uh, Bitcoin, or yeah. any other token. So my question is: Has uh, Solidity provide a way to to receive a struct, as a, uh, to return a struct, to so pass a struct as a parameter of a function? Uh, you think you can in Chainlink? Uh, this way. Yeah, those are multi-word responses where you basically provide multi-prices uh, in one request. That's something we are working on. Currently, we support only one word, uh, but that's something we are working on. Yeah, great question. Yep. Did anything bad happen to the like of bad data that then the, the nodes fed to the smart contract? With Chainlink or in the ecosystem in general? Uh, the ecosystem in general. So, Synthetix recently got a bad issue where there was a huge arbitrage opportunity for $1 billion. You can read it on uh, Reddit, actually. Uh, one faulty oracle provoked a massive problem. Uh, now, DeFi is still very young. If we already have issues with Oracle at this point in the industry, you can expect what it would be in a few years if there is not a reliable way to provide data, right? So, really, like Ethereum, we can't have many doubts. Like, yeah, we can always question stuff, right? But smart contracts, if you think about it, they're probably secure, right? Like you don't have a lot of ways to break a smart contract. Now the data that's getting into a smart contract is really the central point of failure right now in most of DeFi apps. Uh, that's something that the industry is very conscious of. And that's why we are talking to multiple DeFi projects. And a lot of them are trying new solutions to kind of get more decentralized data in a more reliable way. Just because if it hasn't already broken, it will break in the future. Yeah, I'm a bit apocalyptic on this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's done. Unboxing. Uh, so yeah, it's already a bit late, so I'll try to make it quick. I just show the contract, what it contains. Um, so yeah, here, whenever you get a chaining box, you get a very basic Solidity contract. Uh, you get some functions, you get a create request too, which is basically I'm going to create a request with an oracle, a job ID, a payment I'll specify, URL, path, um, times, which is the number of times we want to multiply the result. Uh, since Solidity doesn't support um, decimal points, then it's, you often have to multiply your result. Uh, and then, yeah, basically you can create a request, build chain request. So it's very similar to what we saw with the Alice and Bob example, except that it's much more uh, modular, functional. You can adapt it very easily to your needs. Um, so it's downloading, what's, what, what? It's downloading some C-sharp package. I haven't done C-sharp in a while, but yeah. Um, so, oh, okay, I can still deploy. Uh, so I'm going to deploy my, uh, just to show it's working, I'm going to run some tests. Uh, to show that basically the truffle box we get is going to perform some tests. So let's say we are sending a request without sending any payment to the Oracle or multiple kind of unit tests like this. We are going to test them out here. Uh, so yeah, you can see the, the test here. We put a number of tests just for people to see uh, if their smart contract is performing well whenever they deploy it. Uh, so yeah, very basic stuff basically. Uh, we are still using 4.2.4, uh, 4.24 uh, Solidity. Uh, we are updating for 5.0 very soon, but that's why there are some warning. Um, if I'm going to migrate to Robston, uh, so you 
if we go to Truffle Config again, that's something very nice with Truffle. It's very, like it streamlines uh, the way to deploy contracts. It makes it very easy for you. So I've already deployed the uh, environment variables for myself on my computer, uh, where basically I have my memo manic for my uh, main wallet. I have uh, the network I want to connect to. So in this case, we have Robston. So yeah, in my case, it's very easy to deploy using npm run migrate live to Robston. Uh, I'm just going to deploy this smart contract, which does an ethuasy request in a very uh, simple manner. We are using some scripts here that you can see just to try out uh, what we are deploying. Any questions? I didn't talk much, so, yeah. I was also wondering how are the nodes incentivized on the testnet? Yeah, like nodes on the testnet, basically if you're running on mainnet, it's going to be a very similar architecture, right? So nodes are incentivized to be on the mainnet, not on the testnet. Currently, on the testnet, we have some nodes. We also provide nodes ourselves, you know, just to make sure that you have the critical infrastructure. Now, a lot of this is really community-based, right? It's very similar to Cosmos, where a lot of nodes will provide stuff for free, kind of, uh, just to get appreciated by the community. And it's very similar on, uh, on Chainlink, where, hey, guys, you want to develop smart contracts on Robson? We have our nodes on Robson. Maybe use us on mainnet later on. And here, you get incentivized on mainnet, you know? Get some uh, link to that. So, yeah, here we are deploying the contract. So, if you have any more questions, <laughs> yeah. Um, is the smart contract owner choose by himself the Oracle, right? Yeah, yeah. And anyone can be an Oracle node. Yeah, anyone can be an Oracle node. That's why um, there is going to be a reputation system. Also, there are going to be commitments on chain to see who's delivering good data, who has his node online or offline because it's a permissionless system. It's not permission, like anyone can currently spin up their own node mm -hmm. and get chosen uh, by a smart contract creator. Uh, currently, we have 60 nodes online. Uh, expect this number to grow a lot, yeah. The, the question is, what if, if you create a smart contract and you are yourself the node, the oracle, yeah. and you can then change the information, uh, is there any uh, way to provide it? I mean, if someone wants to do it, he can, but like, I wouldn't use that system, you know? Mm. <laughs> like, don't, don't use it if, if this guy is doing it, because you have the full code, you can see on chain what he's doing. So, yeah, I mean, don't, don't use someone who's doing this, basically. Like, if it's a DeFi app who's, uh, who's running their own Oracle, then, yeah, like, there is no incentive for them to, to do this. It's all on chain, and uh, anyone can see it, anyone can see the commitment. Oh, this guy just committed to fulfill his own request, great. Like, <laughs> yeah, so basically don't choose it. Yeah. So is it possible for someone to create fake reputation by creating himself a smart contract and calling himself his own node? That's a great question. So basically everything is on-chain currently. Uh, so you can see the commitments. Now, that's a good question. This one... Um, Basically, he would have his own smart contract send requests to himself. So there are some things here. First, he would have to pay gas. Then reputation would also imply that the smart contracts which are calling uh, the oracles would be, like you would probably earn more in reputation if your smart contract is like a DeFi project like Compound or Synthetics, which is known by everyone, you know, and that people know isn't uh, really shady. Like if it's a random contract, which is being called by someone on chain, then reputation would work in a different way. Does that make sense? Right, because you don't know what's, what's happening really, so, yeah. Uh, why don't you use a slashing mechanism instead of, instead of a reputation one? Yeah, that's a great question. Both are going to be used. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, as you probably know, reputation and slashing are stuff that once you have it, you can't really go back on it. So that's why it's taking, like uh, currently it's very heavily in the research, like we have a bunch of scholars working on this. Um, so yeah, we take this very seriously. We are going to have reputation, we are going to have staking implemented. We have service level agreements where basically smart contract creators put on-chain a service agreement that an Oracle can commit to on-chain. So you have everything on-chain, right? You can track everything. And basically you'll be able to have this reputation system and this staking system uh, allowed by these service agreements, which are very much uh, almost, yeah, basically underway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Um, do you have mechanism, for example, I'm uh, writing a smart contract with uh, a bunch of Oracle today. Yeah. Uh, for a smart contract that could be executed in one or two years. Uh, how am I ensure that uh, it's going to be uh, the same or the same Oracle are going to be up and running in one or two years or five years? Yeah, that's a great question. That's also where reputation comes in where we have to make sure that the oracle that you'll be using will be basically as secure as possible. So um, in this case, also oracles will have an on-chain commitment uh, as far as staking goes, where if they are not on-chain anymore, they'll get slashed. So they would have every kind of incentive to still be on-chain. Now, if you are going to trigger the contract in two years, uh, that's for having an uh, oracle that uh, are up and running uh, uh, in the long chain, in uh, at one hundred percent of the time, to have the reputation uh, system. But uh, yeah. for example, those uh, servers can be reassigned to something else. Uh, I, I want to make sure that those oracle are gonna be uh, up and running in five years. For example, if you have uh, ten percent of oracle that uh, disappear and uh, twenty new oracle that appear on the, the network, how am I make sure that some of those uh, those oracle are still going to be up in a, in a long time. Yeah, yeah that's... Uh, the, same, the same question that I asked Yeah, earlier. maybe when you list the, yeah. the oracles, you're, yeah. there is a limitation to listing the oracles. Yeah, in the long term. Uh, yeah. Just the so reputation you deploy your smart contract. I see. I mean, then maybe your system shouldn't rely such on long-term perspectives, right? Whereas you would need to have some kind of process to switch oracles every six months, let's say, and redeploy the contract. Um, now, honestly, in this space, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So I wouldn't deploy a contract which I expect to run for five years without uh, modifying anything, right? <laughs> so. Like you need some kind of upgradable contract, or you need something that's going to run for an amount of time, then self-destruct, then redeploy. You know, like. You can have multiple provisions. That's something that the smart contract creator has full liberty of taking. Um, yeah, but really, when it's long term, then it always gets very touchy because, like long term, you know, up is going to be down and down is going to be up. Like you have no idea what's going to happen. So. <laughs> uh, no plans to, I don't know, develop some kind of uh, node discovery uh, system. Node discovery system. What do you mean by here? This is something that you can do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take, take the relay, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. Not di okay, but let's discuss this after, maybe. Contract, you yeah. request, uh, like, 10 nodes that you can get uh, this information from. So this is something that he can do. And yeah, that's so already available, yeah, so. Yeah, so... Yeah, now the, the demo seems a bit more... Uh, <laughs> so basically, in my demo, it's very simple. We just have three scripts. Uh, we are going to fund our contract. We are going to send a request for the ETH USD price. And we are then going to read the state, like the data that our contract provided, uh, our Oracle, sorry, provided. So it's a very straightforward use case. Now, uh, in comparison with all the questions, it seems a bit vain to... <laughs> but yeah, so... Basically, just to show how easy it is to uh, start requesting data using Chainlink uh, and using a truffle block, like it lit literally takes um, a few minutes when Robston is, uh, is doing all right. Um, so yeah, here I created my contract. Um, if I'm going to request data, then I'm just going to, to call the request data uh, script. Request data network live. Okay, um, so we can see also uh, the state of our request on the explorer. So here, if I go, um, we'll get it will appear very yeah. Net black like Robston is super slow, so it's good that you guys have some questions today because otherwise uh, <laughs> would have been kind of yeah, quiet. Yeah. I was also wondering, you can set the payout, the payouts in like any stable coin or token. Yeah, of course. Yeah, like um, 
it's on Ethereum, right? So anything you want to do, you can do it in DAI, you can do it in... Uh... Now, the cool thing is if you have reference contracts for your coins, so for instance, for ETHUSD, we have a reference contract. Uh, we are going to deploy a few others, um, like BTC, USD, and others. You can check the price in real time, and you can then say, all right, so I have the price of ETHUSD, I, I can calculate how much 50 USD would be worth, you know? Uh, well, like we did with Alice and Bob example, where basically you calculate the price of Ether, uh, calling a reference contract, and then you can uh, calculate how much Ether you are going to send according to this. Uh, so the request is sent. If I go there, then yeah, I can see that I sent a request to my Chainlink node. So here, as we are saying on uh, Robston, most of the nodes will be Chainlink node, you know, uh, just because there are still people running Robston nodes. So. Uh, if you want to use something else than Chainlink. Um, and yeah, basically, I'm going to wait until this uh, request gets, gets fulfilled, and then I'll be able to read the contract uh, using this script, read contract.js, which basically will allow me to check uh, the value of the ETHUSD price. So if the request has not been processed, then the the result will be zero. Otherwise, it should be the current price of Ether. And the current price of Ether is 209.6 dollars. <coughs> uh, so it's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, I got my request fulfilled. I can read this uh, data. Now, that's, that's really not interesting, right? Getting the price of ETHUSD like this, it's not great. However, you can do so much stuff with uh, Chainlink, and this really shows you how easy it is to set up. Like, it literally took me two minutes to unbox the truffle box and to start sending these requests. You know, so I really encourage you, if you have any kind of uh, use case you want to start working on, if the API is public, then it's super straightforward to start working on this. And if the API is private, uh, and if there is no external adapter, maybe we can create it, or maybe you can create it. But yeah, it's a very easy system to use, and it basically allows you to get any kind of data you want from the real world. The, the end goal here is really to allow smart contract developers to have the same flexibility that the people who built Uber had, where, for instance, in five minutes, they had access to a Google Maps API, a payment API, an SMS API, you know? When we get to the same result where smart contract creators can access any API endpoint in virtually minutes, then we'll probably have succeeded in our goal to provide developers with more uh, tools to create compelling dApps which can really change the industries we are trying to disrupt. And yeah, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, any questions, we can just uh, speak uh, after. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.